what is a great TED Talk? What are the elements of a great talk talk? How to give one? What makes a TED.com talk? If you're thinking... <laughs> If, if you're thinking about um, that, that you would like some of the talks from your event to make it on the TED.com, what, what are some of the filters that we look at to come to that decision? Unfortunately, they're really the same. Sort of what makes a great TED Talk and what makes a great TED.com talk are very similar, but I want to talk through that with you in a way that um, you can think about both as you're booking speakers and importantly as you're working with them. So the first thing to think about or that we think about when what makes a great TED Talk is, is tell us something new. So there's a way in which many of us at TED come from journalistic backgrounds and you can sort of almost think about TED as a, as, a, as a biannual magazine on stage. You know, we really think about what is new out there? What are the new ideas? What are different ideas? What's a fresh take? What's something we haven't heard about before? And sometimes it's the topic. You know, there are speakers at, uh, at Global this year who will hear from talking about, uh, you know, claiming that, that plants have brains. Well, I haven't heard that before. That's a really interesting um, perspective. Sometimes it's a really new angle on an old um, topic. For example, if you're going to have a speaker on climate change. Um, you know, we had Al Gore around four years ago. That was a very definitive talk that climate change is a fact. It's a problem. If you're going to talk about climate change now, you need a new angle. So think about having a material scientist. Think about a photographer who's, who's, uh, who photographs icebergs. Think about somebody telling the story in a new way. Um, and we think about this for TED.com both is, is this new and fresh and relevant. And one of the great things and amazing things for us in working with the TEDx community is that you know your communities and there are so many stories and ideas and people and issues that are local to you that could be presented in a way and brought to an international audience in ways that we've never heard of before. You're the eyes and ears in your own regional areas and we're, we're so excited about bringing um, those new ideas in. So the second thing is something I like to think about as evoking contagious emotion. So one of the things we consider for talks on TED is um, are these talks spreading? Are people sharing them with each other? Do they have a viral nature? Now, um, when you think about viral videos online, obviously people first think of things like kitten videos and pranks, things that, um, that you want to share because they surprise you or they make you laugh. But there are all kinds of contagious emotions. People um, want to share something when they've seen something emotional, when um, something brings a, a lump to their, their throat or kind of makes their, brings butterflies to their stomach. They want someone next to them to share it. But they also want to share things that um, teach them something new. If you get an aha moment from a talk, you, you want to teach someone else. You want to let them know. Or if they've learned something really important that feels urgent to them, they want to pass that on. So not every talk has to inspire this incredible you know, uh, uh, desire to, to be shared with somebody else, but many of the great talks do. The next thing to think about is to tell a story. So, and this is something I think that's so fundamental to every great um, TED Talk, is that it's not just relaying facts. It's not just a lecture. A great speaker takes you on a journey. They, they tell you a story. They pull you along with them. And it doesn't matter whether they're talking to you about bacteria or, or architecture or fish or climate change. You're, you're pulled in and you go along with them. And that is not, that doesn't mean that every person has to um, sort of uh, uh, describe their talk as a journey, but it should, it should take you somewhere. So part of telling your great story is being personal. And this is something the you know, a great story um, tells you something about the speaker. Um, that doesn't mean it has to be confessional. You don't want to know everything, but you want to feel them inside the story. You know, a great um, uh, talk is sort of an idea that has a personal story at the center. And that personal story could just be about their, their again, their passion for a certain kind of fish or the, the, um, the, the, the something that they learned in childhood that then brought them to um, a, an insight later on. But the personal story, I I think is the way um, that each of us relate to an individual TED Talk. We may not know anything about the subject matter. We may not have even thought we cared about it, but we can relate to that personal story telling, that person telling us about it. Um, and you can think about it two ways, sort of either a, a personal story with an idea inside or, or an idea that has just a, a personal part, um, a personal story at the, the center. Um, and this is kind of an odd thing to say to you. My, um, my sister-in-law is a rabbi, and she um, uses, she says she uses TED Talks all the time for sermon fodder. And um, she believes that actually every TED Talk is sort of a secular sermon. It's kind of teaching you something. It's, it's giving you a lesson, and it's, and, it's, and, it's, and it's giving you a way to think about your own life and your own journey. And that's very subtle. I don't tell any of the speakers that. <laughs> it's not part of our speaker prep, but it's an interesting lens on what makes a great talk. All right, one more thing on Zone Be per um, the personal you want to guard against people going too far in, in, in that direction. And just a quick example, so we have to fight, one of the trends we have to fight at TED now is every speaker wanting to replicate Jill Bolte-Taylor's talk. So Jill Bolte-Taylor was the neuroscientist who um, observed her own stroke from the inside out 
incredible talk, um, our most popular of all time, um, but it's very unique, you know, and people sort of misinterpret what was great in that talk. It's a great talk because it has science um, combined with emotion. It draws on your left and right brain. It tells an incredible story. She shows a human brain. She almost cries. I mean, it's an incredible journey, but oftentimes people will interpret that as just the part about her sort of crying at the end. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll forget about all of the other pieces that went into it along the way. So guard against that. <laughs> so <laughs> the next piece is um, don't lose the audience. I found this image by um, searching for the word chase on Flickr. But my idea is oftentimes speakers who are such experts in their own area will kind of race ahead of the audience. Um, many of the speakers that we bring, that you bring, are experts in their own field who are used to addressing people in their own field. Scientists are used to talking to scientists, businesses, to business audiences, and so on. And things, and including things, architects and artists are sometimes the biggest culprits. They all use the jargon of their own fields, and it's incredibly um, alienating to the audience. One of the things that you want to talk through with speakers is this idea of making sure that they're speaking to a general intelligent audience. And that's something you can help them with. Because one of the, the things about being inside your own field is you don't know what your jargon is. You don't know that, um, you know, words like postmodernist structure is not really accessible to the, to the, um, the average audience. And that's something that you can bring uh, to, to your speakers by working with them, reviewing their talks, and just seeing and helping them understand, like, you know, I went to college, I don't understand that word. <laughs> you know, or like, I'm tracking with you, but you really lost me there. Can we think of another way of explaining that? Um, and that will be really helpful to them in bringing it along. So, and oftentimes we'll see talks that are such interesting topics, but they're just um, addressed in a way that's, um, th that a general audience can't follow, that's just too specific um, for us to use. So the next thing is start strong. And this actually, for us, it has to do with both our editing, but also with the talk. Um, on TED.com, I think most of you know, we edit all the, or perhaps actually some of you might not. We edit, of course, all the talks that go on to TED.com. No talk was as perfect on the stage as it was when we put it online. We really work to bring the speaker's best selves out. And one of the things that we do, while staying extremely true to what they actually deliver, but we edit out their ums and ahs, if they trip, if they spill water on themselves, all of these things have happened, they won't appear on TED.com. But what we also do that I think has been really important in TED Talk success is we edit the very beginning. So we don't begin with the opening remarks, the hello, it's great to be here, thank you for having me, thank you, Chris. We cut, or even their opening jokes, people like to have an opening joke, but their opening joke kind of distracts. We, like, we edit the talk so they begin right where the talk takes off. Now we do that online because people online are just incredibly vulnerable to distraction. We all know this. You know, you start watching a video and the beginning there's some but there's a host introducing them or something slow and you don't mean to but you just get distracted. You start an email, you start a web search and you're just gone. So we start our talks that way but it, or we edit them that way but it's also a really good thing for you to keep in mind for the talk itself when you're hearing the person rehearse. If you find that they're, you know, we've had speakers at TED who wanted to read two paragraphs out of a letter at the beginning of their talk or who start on something that's not really, what, that doesn't really grab us but then two minutes in they get really interesting. It's just something for you to think about as you're helping the speaker um, revise their talks to start on something that's really compelling and interesting. Another thing to think about is focus. Um, so 18 minutes is a very short period of time, as you all know, and the shorter talks are even shorter. There's a time for one idea. It's really, it's only time for one idea, and it's so hard for most speakers, and I know, and I speak, and I'm guilty of the same thing, you want, they want to tell everything, um, and, or they want to have multiple um, ideas and get it all in within 18 minutes, and they do that either by rushing through things, or um, by leaving things out, or simply not quite making sense in the end, or just not fulfilling the, um, the potential of the talk. So the more you can kind of focus in, the better. So this next one is in thinking particularly about TEDx talks um, coming on to TED.com. In curating most of your events, you always want, I think, a mix of local event, uh, of sort of local ideas and, and global ideas. One of the things with many of the TED, um, it's the TEDx talks that we've looked at, is that they're, very, is that they they can often be very local without um, addressing the audience in a way that could be expanded beyond that. And we ha we have this issue at TED as well as we work with speakers. I think all of your your events or many of them will have local talks, talks that are really interesting to the people in the room. To to the local community, but those talks don't quite, 
aren't quite appropriate for TED.com. For the ones that we would use, you want to be able to extract wider. So if it's a local idea, have it presented in a way that a wider, that where the wider audience can see um, relevance. And part of the things that go into that are um, being aware of, so just sort of um, regional knowledge. Um, so if you're talking about something locally, if there's, a, if there's an issue in Houston or if there is a new building going up in Sao Paulo, everyone in the room might know that this is happening, but just helping the speaker to build in just a sentence of context about what it is they're talking about will help a talk sort of transcend the room and move into the, um, the sort of the wider uh, or, or be applicable to the wider uh, world. Um, so by saying this again, don't mean that you shouldn't be covering sort of local ideas and issues, but should be thinking about it with an eye toward the people who aren't in the room. And this is actually something we've really had to train ourselves on at TED, is that we're not addressing you know, a thousand fairly wealthy people in a room in California anymore. We're just not. We're addressing the world, and that really shifts how we think about the program that we're presenting, our obligation to be broad, our obligation to diversity, um, and, and to think about things more um, deeply. And I'll give you one example of a talk we put, um, a talk that really made us kind of rethink things. So we um, often, of course, have audience talks at TED, both at TED University and on the stage. And one talk that was just great in the room, we've actually had a couple like these. People like to show so, um, vacation photos. And so we've had a couple of talks. One of them was about a trip that someone took to North Korea and his kind of perspective on and sort of what he learned in this trip. It was fascinating to, you know, the, the group in California that was listening to it, but it really sounded a little bit offensive once you put it out onto a global stage. And it wasn't actually that there was anything, um, he was not, he's not a, there was nothing wrong with the talk in the context it was given, but it really had the wrong tone once you open it up to the wider world. And so that's the kind of thing that you really have to think about, again, as you're thinking about taking talks from a TEDx event to TED.com, that it's going to be going to a much wider audience. Finally, the, I think the, the biggest secret to the success of any TED Talk is practice. It's rehearsing. It's working with the speaker from the first moment that you talk to them and getting them used to the idea that they're going to have to practice and rehearse to get it right. The sort of heartbreak that we have with talks both at TED and the ones we'll watch from TEDx where we're like, that's such a good talk, but it wasn't the best talk that person could give. They had, so they had a really good talk in them, but they didn't quite get it out. And the difference, honestly, between sort of a, a medium talk and a great talk is often just practice. It's, have, it's having the person commit to actually rehearsing. And this is something that speakers will often resist, our speakers um, as well, I'm sure this happens with, with your speakers, is that they kind of think they're above it or they think it's kind of silly or they think they don't need it. Everyone needs to rehearse. And it was interesting to me, we just did a program at um, the Cannes Advertising Festival. It was a one session TED and uh, Hans Rosling, was speaking. He's the the, uh, the Swedish professor of global health who shows statistics on the screen and narrates them crazily. And he's a fantastic speaker. He has five talks online. I think he has more views as a speaker than any other speaker on, on TED.com. And all of the other speakers were furious with me because I had put him on first. <laughs> so they all had to follow him. But one of the things that actually several of them kept noting to me is, is they were watching how much he rehearsed. So from the second we opened up the room and we were still setting it up for hours and hours he had this sort of, it's actually the new, a new talk that just went up two days ago. He has a table and all of these props. And hours and hours he kept going over and over again with a countdown clock, moving the things around, practicing, getting his phrasing right. And he's one of the most successful speakers on TED. So that's one of the things that you can really um, integrate into your own sort of practice as a TEDx organizer and really impress on your speakers is that the best talks are produced by practice. Um, so that is what I had to share with you today. Just to close, again, just incredibly impressed with all of the work that you're doing and so looking forward to seeing all of your talks come in and to talking to you over the next week. Thanks. Thank you.